Well, I've got to tell you, you know, I remember when you used to wait five and a half months. Now it's been three months and it, it feels like five and a half months, but I'm, I'm so excited. Um, and also, you know, we're starting at the right time as well. Last year, because of COVID, we only started in July. This year, we're starting on time in March. So I, I'm so amped, I can't tell you. Okay, so we, we've got to first understand that, don't forget, 2021 was meant to be the year of the major change in Formula One. But because of COVID, it's now been pushed back to 2022. But there are some significant changes that are happening in 2021. I'll go through them very, very briefly because some of them are very, very technical. But first one is the DAS system, the dual axis steering system, which was innovated by Mercedes-Benz, has been outlawed. Now, whether or not it actually had a huge effect, I'm not entirely sure because, uh, well, we didn't really see it in operation too much during 2020. But that's out of the window. The significant changes all revolve around aerodynamics. What the FIA and Formula One are trying to do is to try and get the racing closer to each other. And by doing that, what they, they need to do is have less aerodynamics so that the cars can follow each other a little bit closer. So the floor of the car towards the back has now been narrowed and it also isn't allowed to have a whole lot of nodules, one could say, in order to assist with the airflow. So that is a major change. The rear diffuser has also been shortened, okay, but watch out for the McLaren because they seem to have made a little adaptation which has been very, very clever um, in terms of that. So that's the aerodynamics. The front nose um, as well, there's a floor um, if you look at uh, the Mercedes specifically and the Ferrari and the Red Bull, they've got a, an extra floor that goes under the front nose. So the front nose has also uh, changed quite dramatically. Tires have also changed from Pirelli. They're calling it a more robust compound, which should slow the cars down a little bit um, in, in 2021. Just a little anecdote. Last year at the Silverstone Grand Prix, Pirelli recorded the fastest ever apex speed of a Formula One car. So it just shows you how fast these cars actually are. Um, so they, they're trying to slow the cars down a little bit um, through the aerodynamics, also through the um, tire um, compound. But engineers are very, very clever people. So we'll see what, uh, what transpires during the course of the season. Yeah, it's, it's quite a confusing one. I mean, Pirelli, when they first came into the sport and they were told develop compounds or whatever, we had hard, medium, uh, soft tyres, then we had super soft tyres, then we had ultra soft tyres, super hard tyres. Um, so let's go through it. In wet weather conditions, there are two categories of tyres. It's an intermediate tyre and it is a full wet weather tyre. That's it. When it comes to the dry compound tires. They now range from C1 to C5, yet your commentator is still going to say he's on the soft, the medium or the hard because that's basically how we can remember it. If you want to know, C1 is the hardest compound. From there C2 is slightly less hard. C3 is what you would call a medium tire, C4 is soft and C5 would be the softest of the compound given by, by Pirelli. All of the drivers and all of the teams will get exactly the same tyres for every single race. And this has a lot to do with the way that COVID um, has, has changed the, the dynamics of uh, the running of, of Formula One. In the past, the drivers could allocate or select that they wanted three soft compound tyres, eight mediums and four hards. Now all of the drivers will get exactly the same compound for every single Grand Prix. Um, for the first season in, in Formula One, testing has been reduced significantly. In the past, well even last year, um, prior to, to the stop of the season, uh, there were six days of testing in Barcelona. No testing in Barcelona this year because of COVID, so the testing took, has, took place in Bahrain, where the first Grand Prix will be held. But only three days of testing. Is it enough? Um, quite difficult to, to give a, a full answer on that, but we're into the seventh year of the hybrid technology. So you've got to believe that from a reliability point of view, that's more than enough time for the teams. 
going into 2022, I would surmise that there will be extra extra days allocated, um, but that's that's still a way, uh, you know, a, a year away. 2021 testing in Bahrain. What can we read into it? It is nearly impossible to analyze what the teams have done. We've seen teams doing, uh, um, one would assume, heavy fuel loads, long runs, and we've looked at comparative times and say, ah, oh, those are pretty close to each other. So we assume over long distance running, the cars are relatively close. But we don't know how much fuel each of those um, cars have got how long those uh, those tires have been running what the temperature i mean what the pressure of those tires are however there are one or two things that i've picked up from from testing for example as we all know ferrari had a very very difficult year in 2020 and their major problem of course was uh, straight line speed and and that um, unfortunately affected them and of course their two customer teams that being haas and alfa romeo alfa romeo have shown an incredible turn of speed in testing. However, what does it mean? We're not entirely sure. But on day one, first session going out, Kimi Raikkonen went out and set a very respectable time and it took a lot of people to actually get to that time during the course of the day. So you've got to believe that the engine power that Ferrari are giving to Alfa Romeo is significantly improved. Has it helped Ferrari? We assume it has helped Ferrari, but we haven't really seen anything at this stage. Other teams, just to watch out, Williams, I think, have made a significant improvement specifically with George Russell. So I think they are some, somebody to watch that are definitely going to be creeping up to the likes of Alfa Romeo and maybe even Alfa Tauri. Um, and then the team, I think, to watch uh, out for quite closely is McLaren because McLaren are going from Renault power to Mercedes power, did a huge amount of running over the uh, test sessions and had uh, no reliability issues. So um, that I think stands very, very well for them. They're the only team that went in with a new engine fitting into their, their chassis. So I think things look pretty good for, for McLaren. Okay, so let's look at our new drivers that we've got. There are quite a few drivers that are changing teams. Daniel Ricciardo is going to McLaren. Um, sure, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Carlos Sainz is going from McLaren to uh, Ferrari. Sebastian Vettel is going from Ferrari to Aston Martin, which is a new team, okay, even though it was racing points. So let's start with uh, Sebastian Vettel and Aston Martin. Wonderful to have such a prestigious name again in the world of, of Formula One. They did playing the world of Formula One in the, in the uh, 1950s, a little bit of the 1960s, but it's just such a wonderful name. Uh, the car looks, looks magnificent, although they did have a very difficult time in testing. Is this uh, the swan song for Sebastian Vettel? We'll have to wait and see. But out of our new drivers that we have in, in Formula One, guy that I'm really excited to, to watch is uh, the young uh, Yuki Tsunoda, who goes into Alpha Tauri. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why I like this guy. Number one, he's super fast. Number two, he's diminutive. He's tiny. He only weighs about 50 kilograms and he's only five foot two. So that means a team like Alpha Tauri, when it comes to moving ballast around in terms of weight distribution in the car, they've most probably got 15, 20 kilograms more to play with than any of the other teams. So I think he's a really top class uh, young kid to watch out for. And then of course in the, in the Haas team, we have two brand new drivers. Um, Nikita Mazepin uh, comes in uh, uh, under Russia, although he can't race under Russia, so we still don't know what country he's gonna race under. And then of course, the return of the Schumacher name. Um, Mick Schumacher, the son of Michael Schumacher, stepping into the Haas team, a Ferrari Academy driver. A lot will be expected of him. Unfortunately, the vehicle, the car that Haas are going to be giving both their drivers this year is not going to be very competitive. Just remember that from now. It's not going to be competitive. They are really throwing all of their eggs into the basket for 2022. But it's great to have uh, my, uh, Michael Schumacher's son Mick on the grid. And then, you know, you mentioned Fernando Alonso. I mean, we're going to have Alonso, Raikkonen and Schumacher on the grid. I mean, you'd be mistaken for thinking it's the early 2000s, but that's what it's going to be. 
The return of Fernando Alonso to Alpine, which is the Renault team, now changed its name to Alpine, is significant. Um, hopefully they give him a really, really strong car that he's able to be competitive with. We know his, uh, his capability, we know his pedigree, and we need to see the likes of um, Alonso, Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton, Charles Leclerc, Carlos Sainz, Daniel Ricciardo, Valtteri Bottas. Love to see those guys really, really fighting out um, at the front. We don't want another two horse race. Twenty twenty one is a strange season for Formula One because it's an interim season, as I've alluded to earlier, before the major changes of twenty twenty two. So the cars are very much an evolution of what we had last year. However, the changing of the the aerodynamic uh, floor floor of the car, the rear diffuser. We'll see cars that'll have a different rake, which means that some of the cars will look higher in the back than 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 uh, than others. Hopefully they're going to have a significant change that will allow people to go and compete against Mercedes. They are still way ahead of everybody else, but Red Bull did look very good in testing. But as I say, what does that mean? We'll only know when we get to qualifying on, on Saturday of the, of the first Grand Prix. But I'm really hoping that there is going to be a, 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 a stronger battle against uh, Mercedes-Benz. Whether it comes from Valtteri Bottas within the team with, with Lewis Hamilton, or if it comes from Max Verstappen and Red Bull, or McLaren, or Ferrari, um, or, or anybody else, um, let's, let's hope for some great, great racing and, um, and something a lot closer. Mercedes, of course, are going to be right up there, so um, you've got to expect them to be uh, the dominant, dominant force. But the sort of unknowns, it's Honda's last year in Formula One. They're going to give it the full beans with, with Red Bull Racing. And you've got to believe that in order for a team like Red Bull to hold on to Max Verstappen, they've got to give him something that he can challenge with. If they don't, they're going to lose him and he's maybe one of the most spectacular drivers we've seen in many, many years. The unknowns has to be Ferrari. We don't know. They finished sixth or seventh or fifth in, in the championship last year. I mean, all of a sudden we're saying, you know, uh, it's an unknown of, of Ferrari. Ferrari, we honestly don't know. They could have 40 horsepower more, they could have 50, they could have 60. We, we will only know once we start, start racing. And the one team, honestly, that I say look out for, you, you've got Red Bull, you've got Mercedes, Ferrari and unknown, is McLaren. McLaren, even with a new engine and, and they might have a few gremlins that, that creep in um, with, with uh, the software and the hardware putting together, they have got a phenomenal team. They've got Ricardo and Norris who are very, very capable racing drivers. But they've got Zach Brown, they've got Andrea Seidel, they've got uh, Andrea Stella and they've got James Key. And pardon the pun, but that could be the key to great success for McLaren. Well, I, you know, I think a lot of the cars have got, gotten into different color paint schemes this year. And I, 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 number one, I must say, I think the cars look magnificent. Some of the liveries, not entirely sure. These cars are also so difficult to see just from pictures. And whether it's high resolution, pictures in cameras um, or video footage, until you see them in the flesh, do you really appreciate what these cars actually, actually look like. I love the fact that they've gone with that sort of normal Ferrari red and then slightly more maroony towards, towards the back. And I mean, that was sort of the color of the original Ferraris when, when, when they raced. So I think bringing in a little bit of the heritage um, is, is um, pretty interesting. Everyone has been talking about the green that was on the Ferrari with the Mission win now. I mean, there's, this, there's a very uh, beautiful story behind it about people trying to be more earthly, more green, trying to save our planet. And I think it's, you know, it's important and it's, it's also um, quite uh, significant the way that Formula One has embraced this and are trying to do their bit uh, as well. So, yeah, I, 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 like, I like the look of the Ferrari. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I say watch out for McLaren. I really think McLaren could be the dark horse, but Ferrari could be the dark horse. I mean, it's weird to say that, but Ferrari could be the dark horse, all depending on 
what we see when, when we go um, in, into qualifying. Alpha Tauri, with the likes of Pierre Gasly, they won a race last year. They've, they've got sort of Red Bull behind them as well. They really are an exciting team to watch. Yuki Tsunoda, I think, is, will be the rookie of, of, of the season. So um, I'm, I'm really, really excited for, for them. And George Russell. Uh, for the first time, we saw when he stepped into the Mercedes last year how competent and what a brilliant racing driver he is. But I think Williams are definitely three or four levels ahead of where they were in 2019. And I expect George Russell to be fighting in the 10, 12th position uh, regularly. And I wouldn't be surprised to see George Russell accumulate some good points for Williams and it'll be the first time Williams will achieve points in quite a few seasons. So I say watch out for, for George.